I think this is going to be our best roster going into the season. We've never had a roster even close to this talented from day one, able to have a whole offseason training together, um, able to have a summer and be to, being able to get that experience at the Olympics. Maxi being able to, you know, stay in the gym and get swole. And then Paul George just putting in work in the offseason in those AJ Johnson videos. So this is really exciting. Um, I think the next best team that we had coming into a season was that first Doc Rivers year, I believe, when we had uh, Danny Green, uh, Seth Curry, and those guys. And we ended up first in the conference that year. Um, before we ended up losing to the Hawks and the whole Ben Simmons drama. So this is the best season from day one. I know everyone talks about that Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris team, but Jimmy didn't get in until about 14 games into the season. So he didn't have a training camp. And then Tobias was basically after the halfway point of the season, we got him. So we kind of had two guys change the whole dynamic of the team mid-season. And, and people online on Twitter always are like, oh, the Sixers should have won that year. 18-19 was their year. But really, I mean, they had no training camp. I think if you said Jimmy and JJ and Tobias and all those guys were on the team in the preseason and all that, yes, different story. But the fact that those guys came in mid-year and they expected us to beat that talented Raptors team, like that was a good series. It went to seven. And I think if we would have won in seven, we're winning the whole chip that year. So this is the best roster that we've had coming into the season. Uh, I'm excited to see how KJ Martin plays and what we can get for him if he doesn't play too great. We literally got everybody that we wanted to get as part of the offseason plan. Um, I don't think I imagined that the offseason would go this well. I was expecting maybe we end up with Contavious Caldwell Pope, um, Clay Thompson, maybe. Uh, just guys that aren't like the number one or at least a former number one option like Paul George. Not only did we get Paul George, we ended up with Caleb Martin, ended up with Eric Gordon, Reggie Jackson, Kyle Lowry came back. Um, I think we drafted well. Uh, Jared McCain. At M. Bona, you know, I think Ricky Council is going to turn into something. Really excited that we brought Kelly Oubre back. It it really went almost as perfect as possible. I'd say the one miss was uh, not getting Nicholas Batum back. I think if he came back, I think I would be fairly confident that we would be, you know, in the conference finals. Uh, I still think right now conference finals or bust. If we don't make the conference finals, I think it was a wasted year or it was a bad year. Um, and I just hope that, you know, I only see us not making it if there's big injuries, which would be really disappointing for us as Sixers fans, as we've endured years and years of injuries. So uh, today, what I really want to talk about is the Sixers depth, what that looks like, um, restrictions. So the schedule just came out and the Sixers have 15 back-to-backs, which is three more than last year and more than what we've had in the last few years, which is crazy because I feel like we've had so many back-to-backs. So for us to get 15 back-to-backs again, kind of crazy. So, um, but I think that ties into the depth and I think I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, how the Raptors load managed Kawhi and how that might be able to relate to us with Paul George and Joel Embiid and maybe even a little bit with Kyle Lowry. I know when we got Reggie Jackson, a lot of people were kind of, you know, on the fence about it, but I think he's going to be very important when we're considering the load management of some of our players. Um, and then talking about what our depth looks like in those games that Embiid and Paul George sit, those games will be very important to us. Um, and I'm very curious on how the Sixers are exactly going to do it. Are there going to be games that they sit Joel and Paul George at the same time? Are they going to try to stagger when they sit on those back-to-backs? So, like, if we have a game on a Monday and a game on a Tuesday, does Embiid sit on Monday and Paul George sits on Tuesday? Or are they just going to sit them both on Monday if Monday's against, like, an easier team and then have them both play against a harder team? 
or vice versa. I know in the past they've tried to play Embiid against easier teams so you can guarantee yourself a victory. And then up against the harder team, they sit Embiid, which frustrates all of us as Sixers fans. But uh, they're trying to secure the wins that they know that they should get. So if they're playing the Hornets, they're going to play Embiid so we make sure that we beat the Hornets. And then if we are playing, you know, the Thunder, who were the number one seed in the West, they might sit Embiid and just take that as a scheduled loss. Um, I don't really agree with that. I, I would prefer that Embiid plays in the harder game. And then right now, you know, hope that we have the depth to still take care of a team like the Hornets. So uh, we're really going to get into all of that and how all of this works together with our current roster. So looking at our depth right now, at point guard, we have Maxi, Lowry, and Reggie Jackson. At shooting guard, I see Caleb Martin as the starting two guard, um, Eric Gordon as our backup, and then McCain as our third string. Um, I think they see McCain right now as a combo guard, but not really a point guard yet. And they have Lowry and Jackson, so I don't think McCain's going to be getting too many point guard minutes, maybe some combo guard minutes where he sometimes takes the ball up. Um, and then also, like, on those games where maybe Paul George sits or there's an injury, then McCain might get some more minutes as a point guard. Um, at small forward, we have Paul George backed up by Ricky Council. I'm really hoping he gets some backup three minutes. I know um, Oubre also is considered, you know, our starting power forward, shooting guard, wherever you want to list them. It doesn't really matter. They're all wings. But um, Oubre, you know, can be seen as a backup three, too. Um, and then we have that power forward. I list Ubre as the power forward, especially after that conversation um, where Drew Hanlon, Joel Embiid, uh, and Tyrese Maxey's trainer um, mentioned that Embiid last year really wanted Ubre to work on the Aaron Gordon cutting for Jokic, where you know when Embiid's posted up or he's at the top of the key, you know Ubre really knows when to flash or when to cut back door. So MB can hit him with those easy dunks and, and things like that. So that's really why I view Ubre as our power forward. He also doesn't shoot a high percentage from three. Um, he shot 31% during the regular season, which I attribute some of that to the car accident and the rib injury, um, where his percentage is really plummeted after he came back from that. But um, if you guys remember, Ubre actually shot 39% from three in the playoffs against the Knicks. And he was taking 3.8 attempts a game. So I'm hoping that he can really build off of that. He really does make tough shots. He takes tough shots. He really doesn't care what his percentage says. He's going to take a shot and he's going to feel confident he's going to make it. And I think we love him for that, actually. Backing him up at the power forward, I see KJ Martin there. And I know everyone keeps skipping over him and he's an afterthought. But, you know, those Rico Hines runs, you see KJ Martin out there with the other guys, Bona, McCain, um, Doughton, they're all working hard out there. And K.J. Martin's been in those videos shooting a lot of corner threes. Like, if K.J. Martin could turn into some version of P.J. Tucker, except bouncy, like, that would be kind of insane. Like, if he put on some strength, you know, shot the corner three at a high rate, um, and then, like, you know, was good at being in the dunker position when need be, I think K.J. Martin is really good to be an option there at our power forward position. And I think if he plays well enough, we might not even consider making a trade. We might just browse the buyout market for that last player. If KJ really looks good uh, in that role as a backup four, maybe sometimes a starting four. Um, and then the last thing I really want to talk about too is like the load management that I see this year, knowing that we're going to have a 15 game, 15 back to backs this year, which is crazy. So I think that Embiid and Paul George are both going to go for 65 games because obviously they want to get awards. Like they both want to be all NBA. They both want to add to their legacy as um, they want to be all defense. Like I know Embiid really still wants to be all defensive uh, player. He wants to go for defensive player of the year. Like he wants those awards and I'm sure Paul George wants to be all NBA. So those guys are really going to try to play 65 games. But if you subtract you know, 15 back-to-backs from the 82-game season, that means if they if neither of them played in back-to-backs, 67 would be the most that both of them can play, which is really interesting to think about. So let's say they didn't play any back-to-backs 
and had an injury, there's it's going to be hard for them to make the 65-game threshold. So we really got to hope that both of those guys can stay healthy. Um, and maybe Paul George plays in some back-to-backs. Um, I really wouldn't want Embiid to play in a lot of back-to-backs. Maybe if he absolutely felt great and, you know, it was maybe against an easier team, two easier teams, all right, cool, back-to-back. But I'm not sure how I feel about Embiid playing in back-to-backs, you know, at his size at this point in his career. So um, that leads me into the load management that the Raptors were successful with Kawhi the year they won the championship. Kawhi played 60 games that year with load management. So that's not looking too good for Embiid when it talks when we're talking about the 65 game threshold to get awards. Um one, you know, bad slip or something and he might miss a week or two and you know, then with the back-to-back thing, like he might fall under 65 games. Um, you know, pretty fast unless the Sixers decide all right, we really want him to get the 65 games, so they play him in back-to-backs at the end of the season, which is probably when we don't want him playing in back-to-backs. If he's going to play in some back-to-backs, like at least have him when he's fresh early on in the season, have him playing like three, four back-to-backs and build up that that room for if he misses a couple games or in something like that later in the season. Um, Embiid's best seasons, which were 2017, 2018, 2021, and 2022. He played 63, 64, 68, and 66 games. Those are his best seasons. He was playing those many games. So he's only made the 65-game threshold, if that was a thing beforehand, twice. So that, even though in 21 and 22, he played 68 and 66 games, he only played 39 last year, so... It's going to be really hard for him to play 65 games, but, you know, hopefully with Paul George and Maxi stepping up, Embiid will not feel the need to have to do so much on offense, and maybe he can, you know, not have the usage rate that he's had in the past. Maybe he can focus more on defense and not do so much on offense, and maybe he'll have more energy to play more games and, and things like that, so... I hope that, you know, this USA basketball experience helped Embiid to be able to take a little bit of a step back and um, allows Maxi and Paul George to do a little bit more for the team. Paul George also has an injury history. Um, Since he had that really gruesome injury, um, he played 81 games after he came back from that, then 75, 79, 77. Then it was in 2019 when he first got to the Clippers where he only played 48 games and then 54 and then 31 and then 56. But then last year, he actually had a good a good year where he played 74 games and played in the playoffs. So, you know, I guess you could say hopefully he's on the backup taking a step back to Kawhi last year. He was able to manage 74 games. So hopefully this year with some load management, he can still reach like 70 games. And then about Reggie Jackson, I just think his importance is really in those games that we're not going to have Paul George. So we're going to need him to score 9 to 13 points maybe, come in, be a spark, kind of in that campaign role. He's going to be playing a lot of minutes in those games. Maybe some minutes, some games where Lowry's playing low minutes, or maybe Lowry played 32 minutes the night before. I don't want Lowry to play another game after doing that. I mean, he's almost 40 now, so those games are really going to be Reggie's games to be our backup point guard, um, and he's really going to, you know, be able to get a bucket for us without Paul George. You know, obviously, when he has Kayla Martin and Kelly Oubre and Embiid and Maxi, he'll be able to fit him right there and get some buckets for us. Um, our roster, I think, when we sit Embiid, is really not going to look too different. I think when on those games, all you're going to do is get an uptick in Andre Drummond minutes. And then obviously Adam Bona is going to be playing a lot more minutes in those games. Maybe like, you know, 15 minutes in those games to give Drummond some breathers. Um, We might need a little bit more offensive creation without Embiid. So maybe Reggie gets an uptick in minutes in those games where we don't have Embiid. I think definitely when Paul George sits, Reggie Jackson is going to get a lot more minutes in those games. Um, and I don't know what the lineup's going to look like without Paul George. In those games that he sits, I think it's really going to be matchup-based and who we're going against because you're going to have Maxi, Martin, Oubre, 
Embiid, but that fifth person could be KJ Martin. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's Reggie Jackson in the starting lineup for those games without Paul George. Maybe we you know stick someone else out there like uh, maybe we put Ubre on the bench and start Council, or maybe Council is you know our backup three and maybe he slides into the starting lineup for those games. Who knows? I think they have a lot of ways it can go when Paul George sits. Um, and then obviously when Kyle Lowry sits, if we manage him a little bit more, you're going to get a lot of Reggie Jackson minutes. So I'm really excited to start making these videos and hope that you guys follow along, subscribe and tag in and uh, follow my Twitter, you know, Clutch Chris 76 I'm always tweeting, got some good tweets out there and hoping to uh, find some other Sixers fans out there that are just as crazy as I am. All right, y'all. Have a good one.